Hello and welcome to Kingdom Stories. It's so good to have you here. Today we have a special guest, my cousin, Andrew Harwood. This guy has a crazy story and I want to challenge you to stick around until the end because you're in for a wild ride. Andrew is also involved in this ministry. He's involved in the website admin and he helped us to set up this site. So I just want to acknowledge him for that as well. And thank you so much, Andrew, for your help that you're, that you're giving to the radio station. Andrew, thank you so much for making time, for sharing your story with me. Um, we grew up as brothers and sisters, my sister and I and him and his brother, and we spent a whole lot of time together, and then we didn't see each other for 13 years, and then Father um, made our paths cross again at a critical time, and we'll tell that a bit later. So, Andrew, thank you for your time, and um, tell us about this story that Father had you on. All right, so I suppose it started when I grew up in a very Christian home. Um, Throughout my youth, I'd have my mother correcting me by Bible verses, which infuriated me. And I suppose that was was my entire experience with Christianity, a very judgmental, harsh thing. And I didn't like it. I saw very little love in it. And any judgment where if you do not conform to my will, then you will go to hell. And I didn't agree with it at all because that versus the God I was led to believe in were two very different things. And that's when I formed the notion that God is not Christianity. God is not religion. God is God. Those are two very different things. And that some people worship the religion and some people worship God. Very seldomly, there are people that find a balance. So, yeah, that was a very negative perspective on that, on Christianity as a whole. And therefore, I started studying other religions, other things close to Christianity. You know, uh, and the Catholics, I studied for a bit. And then two ladies, two Jehovah's Witnesses, came to our fence and asked, would you like to study about Jehovah? And I asked, yes, absolutely. And that got me into that. And I found a couple of weeks after, perhaps even before, I was was plagued by, by demons. I'd see them um, in my room. I'd see them as I'm walking in through the door. I'd feel them watching me while I sleep. And there was one point when I'm not sure how far I was in, if I had even met uh, Jehovah's Witnesses by then, but I dreamt of Satan standing at the end of my bed, seven feet tall, very dark image, drawing all, like sucking all the memories out of my mind. And and I woke up with <laughs> quite a shock, I'd say. And there was a shadowy figure at the end of the bed that had vanished. That was when I moved out of the room. I shared it with my older brother, Dylan. Um, and I moved into the my younger brother's bedroom. And for a couple of weeks, I would sleepwalk and switch the lights on before climbing in bed. So... I suppose that just got me more interested. Uh, I was definitely in a bedroom with my younger brother when um, when I met, was busy with the Jehovah's Witnesses because there was one night, I think it was the week before we learned that anything spiritual, you can call upon Jesus' name and it will go away. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I couldn't physically get up. It was as if I was, I felt uh, pressure actually pushing down on me. And I couldn't open my mouth. I couldn't even open my eyes. So I said, in the name of Jesus Christ. And I was, I was free. I could move. I could open my eyes. I was drenched in sweat. I was absolutely terrifying. I didn't want to go back to sleep, but I was also exhausted. And I eventually did go to sleep. And I suppose that got me even more interested in 
studying the Jehovah's Witnesses because just one thing worked and that was amazing. We eventually ended that when we moved again. Um, and in the other house, I had the small whispers in my mind that I would normally ignore. And then I started talking to them and they were demons. I knew it as soon as as soon as they started talking to them, you can you can feel it. They have a certain type of darkness to them. But they wanted my sympathy. They wanted to make me understand why I should not despise them as much as the world made me believe. And I'm very open minded. So I figured let's let's hear it. Why not? And they said it's because we are allowed to. You see other people think that we just come and go and destroy as we please, but it's because people let us into them, their lives. It is because, because God allows us to. We have the right, we can, which is so far from the truth. Apart from people letting these things into their lives, of course, but if a demon stood at the door, I don't think you'd willingly open it and say, hey, come on, destroy my life. Why don't you? No, absolutely. Especially if you knew what it entails. Yeah. So how do people open their lives to demons? It's through the, through the smallest things. Um, it's researching demonic things online. It's watching series, any type of series connected to demonic things it's listening to certain types of music i i know i sound like a irrational mother when i say these things but it's honestly it's the smallest it's the smallest bloody thing you can do that's all open up the doorway and once that doorway is open it's not the one that steps through it's the thousands that step through and the door is open until god can close it because you can't close it there's nothing in your power that you can do to fight them it's so, only in the power of Yeshua. So you grew up in a Christian house. What did you do to open the door for these things? Do you know? I'd say some of them were generational. Um, and after you see them for a while, or well, after I saw them for a while, I started getting curious. And I'd always been playing violent video games and series and watching these demonic things because they are addressing the one thing that is pestering me and I cannot talk about it to anybody else but there there was the internet and in these movies and games that is where they were and you also researched things what did you research i was researching witches and demonology and that's and wicca and that is what were what opened up all all the doors. And I didn't know it at the time because it's you're following something that is not of God. You are worshipping because you do. You build an altar. Um, I'm not sure if you make sacrifices, but you do worship something that is not godly. Um, it started off is with magic. You know, so I was... In the era, the era, it was 2010 to 2014. There was a lot of magical shows, um, white magic, dark magic, uh, white and black magic, all these things. And I started researching them. I wanted to know the difference. And that is what opened it up the doorways. That is how they got in. What drew me to it is that you do not hurt others. But... After I started studying these things, everything got so much more intense um, spiritually and even in the house. How so? So, in the house, everything just got agitated. It was this air of was so right before an argument you know, you know you're in trouble you walk in this house and you were expecting to get shouted at and that was that was it that was the atmosphere 24 7 and 
I that's stopped awful. sleeping. Yeah, it was. That's so awful, especially if you compare it to, to with God, there is shalom. There's peace, mm. like peace that surpasses understanding. And when you're in the enemy's courts, it's not like that. It's a very interesting observation. Yeah, definitely. And I stopped sleeping at night. I slept mostly throughout the day. That is because the demons are more active at night. So they could, yeah, they, they could speak to me. And we would have these very long conversations about the world and why they can do these things and why they should do these things. Um, and why I should give in. Remember this one conversation with the demon who said, let me just possess you for some time. Just, just so that you can know what it feels like. And I said, that's, yeah. That's insane. So you just said, uh, no, thank you. Or what? I, I was, I was fierce. I said, you will not, nothing will control me, but me. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can, you can live in my head. You can, I think it asked, can I live in you then? And I said, yes, but you will not control me. Dude. Yeah. Like that's even a lot of things to allow though. So you it literally is. allowed a demon to live in you, but just not to control you. Yeah. Okay. So w what year was this moral days? I don't know. It was when I was 14, 15. Right about there. Okay. So, okay. And then um, what happened after that? So, the very next day, told me that I need to start an argument because through chaos, you will gain power. And I did. <laughs> and after that, I started a lot of arguments. And it was just, it, they never made sense, but they didn't meet, need to make sense. The best, most chaotic arguments don't make sense. It's just anger. You just draw the anger out of the other person. And that is what you feed off of. And it empowered me. I could physically feel myself getting stronger. My skin was always burning 24-7. Um, Did you like this control? I liked the power. Okay. But nothing else. I didn't like the chaos that I had caused, the aftermath of the chaos. I didn't, I didn't care about the pain. I was very cut off emotionally. Up until I was baptized, there were there were very, very few things I truly cared about emotionally. Baptized the first time or now? Now. Okay. Interesting. Two weeks ago. Yeah. So okay, let's um let's talk a little bit more about so you you research Rika and then these things happened a lot. Um do you wanna share the story about the cats? Yes, so that was after we moved to Margate, 2015, 2016. And I had, I was sitting in my room, and by then, I think I'd already got delivered. So I was no longer hearing these demons. And I was sitting in my room, and I spoke to God, and I said, I don't really know what you want from me, so what must I do? And then I sat on my bed and started meditating. And I focused on what God was to me. And I said, I bind myself to your will. Bind my soul to your will. So that when I die, you can do with me as you please. Do you think and that was like a kosher thing to do now in hindsight? No. Because God does not ask that of you. Okay. It's not written in the Bible, in the Torah. It is not okay. something Yeshua has ever taught. True. And... I left and I felt energized, but like this cold, emotionally cold energy where I felt empowered. My skin wasn't burning, but emotionally I was cold, completely turned off. And I went outside and I told my mother about it. And then I went to walk on the lawn for a bit because I'd been sitting for 10 minutes. And then I heard this voice say, you and I will be working well together. And I said, who? 
and I asked you, and I asked him, working well together with what, I believe. And he said, well, you will be the bridge between the living and the dead, the physical and the spiritual. Yeah. And then I asked, who are you? And he said, I am death. I was all right. And I said, all right, sure. Fast forward a year or two later, I was in Durban. And it was when I finally moved there. And we got these two kittens, Zorro and Raven. And Zorro was, Zorro was healthy. Raven was really sick. Raven was going to die. But Zorro was all right. He was recovering. He was doing pretty darn good. And then I called on death. And I said to him, save this cat. And he said, well, then you will owe me. And I said, that's fine. I don't care what I owe you. I will do it within reason. But whatever it is, it will be done. And then he said, in order for me to bring a life, I need to take a life. And I said, fine, go for it. Do whatever you must. Later that night, I went to sleep and woke up the next day. And Zoro was dead. And our cat Raven was covering pretty darn well. This is scary. Scary stuff. The spiritual world is almost more real than the real world. So what was the like pinnacle of all this? You like you spoke to demons, the things uh, pasted you, they kept you out of sleep and all that. What what was the pinnacle that made you realize I want out, I don't want part of this anymore? I never wanted that to be honest. I You never wanted I, out or you never wanted I didn't want out. I was happy where I was. Okay. Foolishly. I could I could do things that other people could not. So that sense of power made me feel important. And the demons that I was talking to also made me feel very important. So in a sense, that, that was my family. And I didn't want to go. I was happy. But I also didn't want to live. I wasn't happy being in, in this world. I wasn't happy being alive. And... The night I called and gave myself to God again, when I started walking with him again, it got very dark and it, it almost ended very permanently. And the only reason why it didn't is because I firmly believe that he held me down. I couldn't, I could not move off my bed. And it wasn't a bad thing. I felt comfort. And I felt held down. Um, what do you mean? What do you mean it almost ended permanently? Well, I had made a rule that if I feel this way, and if I have this decision that I want to make for three times in a row, and there is nothing stopping me, then I will do it. And that decision was me killing myself. And there was... There was no reason why I did not. I I thought, what about my family? And then the voices said, what of them? They're fine. I thought, what of my future? And then the voices said, what future? Look at you. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. It was three night, three, three Fridays of this. And... It was early in the morning and I was working the next day and I bought myself a knife and a bucket and I put the knife at the table because if I was going to do this, it was I was going to do it willingly and not impulsively and that was that. Yeah, I I lay there and I couldn't move my body. It's as if I had no connection with my body. But it did not feel frantic like like when I was uh, younger and I was held down with those demons. And then I prayed to God and I said, if, if you have a reason for me to be alive, then take control of my life. Lead me. Guide me. My life is yours now because I don't want it. I've got, no, I've got no business with it. I'm tired of living. 
there's no reason for me to still be alive and there's no reason for me to be here. So I don't understand what my purpose is. And if you do not have a purpose for me, take me now. But if you do, help me. You take control of my life and you guide my steps. You do what you have to do. And then I was out like a light. I don't really remember what happened after that. Like what happened? Did you fall asleep? I think so, yeah. I mean, I'd been crying for the past couple of hours as well because I understood what I was, what I wanted to do and I, and I saw that there was no reason for me to stop myself. So the next day, yeah. So God quite literally kept you from killing yourself. Yeah, I'd say so. So the next day I felt the huge depressive burden, that blackness that was all over me that I was sucked into, thought it was gone, a huge weight that was lifted. My heart was shattered because I truly understood why I wanted to do this thing and what the ramifications of it were. And I understood that the only reason why I didn't wasn't because of me, it was because of God. And that was that was the second time he delivered me. Yeah. So what happened after that? A couple of months later, lockdown happened. After lockdown, Dylan called and I went to Richard's Bay. That was in 2020. Uh, mind you, I was still talking to one of the demons uh, that I had started or that had addressed me, I, regardless. And yeah. So that was Richard's Bay. Things kind of just imploded there spectacularly. And then we moved down to Margate. And Margate is, after a lot of turmoil and a lot of dark experiences, this demon eventually told me that if we are going to continue, it is me or God. You cannot have both. And it showed me a picture of how powerful I could be with the, with the demon. And I saw a street on fire where the tar was molten. The buildings were burning. And I was covered in this robe and in this dark energy. And I was darkness itself. And... I was the cause of that destruction. And I said, if it's a decision between you and me, or you and God, it's going to be God. And that's that. And that's the, that was, I suppose that was the last time I spoke to it directly. So, but this is a high ranking demon. Yeah. Yeah. With, uh, through, through this demon, I could s destroy other demons. I was a threat to the other demons that were plaguing me. I would tell them, you better go before I kill you. But and so, they would go. So, but do you find that, that, so then you could tell them to go away? Do yeah. you find that in the spirit, you have more power now that you have Yeshua, though? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Before I could send the demon away, it had to challenge me. It had to confront me. And I would be filled with this dark anger. You know, I was never at peace. I have not, apart from after I was baptized, I was not at peace for years. From the age of 12, 13, till the age of 25. I hardly, I think I, I only really felt peaceful two, three times. And that was when I was in the presence or when God gave me his shalom. And now it's, it's, it's so incredibly different because I can rebuke them and they will be gone. And I will still be filled with peace and my place will be filled with peace. I can carry on with my life. Whereas before I would rebuke them or kill them and I'd be infuriated for days that they would dare challenge me. How dare they come in my presence 
and try and challenge and beat me, me of all people. What on earth are they thinking? Who do they think they are? So would you prefer this now? Yes. So um, I would just like to share. So we grew up together, right? As I said, like brothers and sisters, the four of us. And then we moved to Bloemfontein. And um, and then later you guys moved to Natal. And we did not speak or see each other at all for 13 years. And um, Father pressed on my heart early in the year around like August that that I should at the end of, I think, some sometime i had to do a trip to Ketan, and then after that i felt like i should do a trip to margate and see them and also to Gauteng and see my other aunt and them um and then i thought you know i'm not going to do it it's expensive and you know i just started a new position in the company and stuff so i'm not going to do that and one monday morning i woke up and father like spoke harshly to me and said you better do that margate Gauteng trip now and I was like, okay, yes, Father. So that was a Monday, the next week, Friday. Uh, so that day I called and I found out, is there space? Can I visit? And they said, yes. And so the Friday I hopped into my car and I went to them. And it was so wonderful to see how much they had grown in the in the spirit. Because at this time, you guys knew a lot about scripture. You had grown a lot in the spirit. Um, I could see that you were really dedicated to Father as well as Dylan, my cousin. And the things that Father had done in that house was amazing to me. Um, and you guys were asking really good questions. Um, and Father really helped me to answer. So this um, on Shabbat, Drew said to me, um, he wants to speak to me about something. And we couldn't get together. And we couldn't get together. And the one day, because I, I was only there for a week, the morning I said, Father, if you want this conversation to take place, just make it take place. And you prayed a similar thing, like make it not make it be impossible to not happen. And then the power went off. Yeah. So I couldn't work. And then the power was off for like long, for four and a half hours unexpectedly. It should have been off for two hours. It was off for really long, but it was just long enough that we could have a good conversation about these things. And um, and so do you remember what you asked me that day, Drew? I don't. We spoke about a lot. Yeah. So you said, do you know of anyone who like walks in the light and walks in the word that knows about spiritual warfare? Because you're looking for someone who knows the truth mm. and really knows what they're doing in with regards to spiritual warfare. And so I was like, as a matter of fact, I do. Um, we, like in my community, like we actually do know a little bit about this. I'm not too clued up about that yet, but there are people who have years of experience that can help you. And um, so then you made a trip to Bloom. And do you want to share about what happened when you came here? Mm. So the week before I went, I was praying a prayer I should not have. And I had made my mind up that I was no longer going. And my cousin, Andrea, Andrea just called out of the blue. And she asked how things are going. I said, great, great. And I told her about this prayer. I, you know, I was praying and she said, so you have no authority to pray these things over other people. I was like, okay, cool. That makes sense. And then she asked, are you still coming? I was like, well, you know, I don't have the finances and the timing and everything. And she said, you know, it's, I understand that you, that you don't want to come, but it's such a great pity because this the weekend could have been, this week could have been such a great revelation growth for you spiritually. Um, and I felt terrible as, as I should have. Um, and then I prayed and I said, I don't know if it is your will. If it's still your will to make it happen, then let it happen. And I think that evening I got the money for it to go. And I told her the very next day. And today, that was Tuesday, Thursday, I booked my ticket. And Friday morning, I was on my way to, my, to Johannesburg, where I would meet Andrea. Then we spent the weekend there with another messianic community and we saw how they did which was very different to me you know i'm not a very outgoing social person so so it, it was it was very loud it was very active it was very social um but it was good and it's something i, I thoroughly enjoyed and then that morning we went to 
Sunday morning, we went, a gentleman was doing a feed, uh, a, a preaching session to the poor, and then they would give them food, those who showed up for the preaching. And I joined, and that was very, very interesting. So I just want to say, this is street evangelism um, that took place yeah. where they go to the streets, like in the city center in um, a town where we were visiting. This was in Vereniging. We were visiting in Van der Beel. In Vereniging, they invited us to be part of their street evangelism that day. Yeah, so I think that's very interesting. And Claude, he had healed three people. And in my well, mind, he I prayed thought, for people for the healing. It. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to share about what happened there? Um, yeah, so I suppose I walked, I, Claude went out to start praying to the people um, for them. And he took a person and he said, Do you want me to pray for you? Is there anywhere that it's hurting? And I think he said, his feet or his back and then Lord prayed over it he put his hand on the person and he prayed over him and he asked the person is the pain gone and this person said yes absolutely and in my mind I thought you know maybe they're faking it maybe they're just saying it so that they don't have to deal with this uncomfortable thing again um, Lord did that with two other people where he asked them he went to the queue and he said, if you are in pain, come to me and I will pray for you. And two other people stepped out and they said that they, the pain also had gone. And that was very interesting to me because I had never been part of any of that. Yeah, so then later on, we made our way back to Blum and... It was very interesting speaking, interesting speaking to Claude about these spiritual things because I, I couldn't speak to anybody else about these things. Um, but most spiritual things is such a heated thing. And if it's not according to a certain standard, then it is not to be spoken of. Um, and I suppose it's seeing how, how people lived it, seeing the differences between Andrea's life and my life and the only what do you thing mean that's by di- that if you say what do you mean by that so you'd, you'd reckon in the movies um, these Christian these godly folk would be perfect they'd get up at a certain time be well disciplined and in the series and in the movies especially 7th Heaven you'd see these people and they'd wake up with a huge smile on their face um, where they'd get up at certain times pray and carry on be well disciplined in their faith very rigid very much something i knew i could not be <laughs> because I'm, I'm i'm not necessarily a very active person in the morning and to my surprise and great comfort i saw that no no they're also human as well <laughs> you don't have to be perfect <laughs> you just need to love god and that's something that had been repeated to me throughout the week repetitively. If you love me, then you will keep my commandments. And God is not saying, well, if you don't get up at seven o'clock in the morning, every single morning for the rest of your life, then you don't love me. Mm. He's saying, if you love me, keep my commandments in, in the best way that you can. Because yes, you're still human. Um, you still have your emotions. You still go through life. But how you can show me that you love me is by trying your best to keep my commandments. Yeah. Cool. So then um, you came, you met the community here that we have. You spent some time with Claude. You spent some time with Amber Alam. And um, do you want to share about Shabbat? Shabbat? Very different. Very different. Um, even very different to the churches I'd gone to. It was more welcoming and just warmer. It was more of a community thing. That more of a community family thing that than a rigid 
thing where you go to church, you listen, and then you leave. Um, you were at when Valhalla asked you to share your thoughts, your ideas. You know, he says at the end of his ministering, he says, "If anybody has any of any ideas, any thoughts, speak up." And that's very different because you don't get that in churches. You don't share your idea. You listen to the domain, to the preacher. That's what I must say. I also um, appreciate about Rafa because they are teaching us, they're teaching us to think for ourselves. So oftentimes yeah. people will come and they'll say an idea that's not right according to scripture, but he like the idea is not, I'm teaching you my things, you need to be a robot at all like mm -hmm. if you have some new idea like we've had some very interesting conversations where we ask each other things and what's your view on this etc and sometimes people would come and say things that are not like according to scripture or whatever and then people are like hold on is that what you just said is not okay i hear you but here in scripture it says this thing so um he wants to train us to sort through what is the truth and what is not and mm -hmm. to know our scripture Mm -hmm. how to debate instead of argue yeah and also like looking for truth where do you find the truth oh, but something happened on Shabbat that was great you were you were delivered do you want to talk about that yes so it started off with me sharing my past experiences and this was it's something I've always wanted to do um just speak to someone about what has happened and to get it out there, you know? And I couldn't. It doesn't matter what, which church I went to. I spoke to the preachers and I said that I would like to talk to them, um, share anything, you know, gain a little bit of insights, help, and nothing couldn't I couldn't speak to anybody about anything especially spiritual warfare but to when I was talking about it they were listening very intensely uh, yeah and it was any whatever I said it wasn't this huge shocking revelation of oh, you unholy creatures um they understood you know they yeah they just it was they were very understanding um, and so I just after, want to say for the listeners that this was in a counseling session situation um, yeah. where it's um, something that we do in the community. If somebody ha needs um, needs help, if they need prayer, if they are struggling in their marriages or whatever it is, and they can request a counseling session and then some people will sit in. Um, one can also request like who you want to be there or specifically request not, but I don't know if that has happened yet, but in any way. So then there's a counseling session and then we hear um, what is the need and we ask the spirit to help us and then we pray for and we address whatever the spirit lifts out mm. yeah and that was very different to anything i'd ever experienced and after that then they started praying over me and yeah it was quite an experience it was as though i was wearing this heavy coat but i didn't know i was wearing it it's like when you wear a heavy piece of clothing, you only know it's heavy once you've taken it off. Mm. And yeah, they started praying over me. And this the entire week, I had been praying that, because I heard with certain manifestations that you would suppress it subconsciously, I think subconsciously repress these things so that they don't come out and I'd been praying that the Ruach work open my heart up make these things manifest manifest in spite of myself even if I try to stop it let it be because I don't I don't want to so I want to be set free completely I want to be cleansed I want to be clean and that is exactly what happened. There were certain things that were, I could feel I was holding onto 
And as Claude had said, just give into it. Because now it is clinging to your spirit. You give into it, it goes into your flesh. Then through that, they rebuke it. That's exactly what happened. Quite a few times. Quite a few times. And it was it was pretty cool. So I was was amazing. I was sweating horrendously. I was perspiring so much. I didn't feel hot at all. And Claude eventually said, I can see the Ruach in you. Start speaking in tongues. <laughs> At which point my brain was like, okay, hear what they're saying and say what they're saying. And Claude had warned me that you need to humble your mind. You need to not listen to your mind when you speak. You need to speak through your heart. Uh, he said, just start speaking. Just start speaking. And I did. And it was certain phrases that I was repeating from what he and Andrea were saying. Um, and he stopped me a few times and he said, "What? It, you're, you're so close. You know, whatever you are holding back, whatever you are holding back in that moment, just start speaking it. And I realized after I let go, so I told the work, you know, let me be your mouth. Um I I am I am simply your mouth. Speak through me. That is all I am. Um, and then that's when I started speaking in tongues. And it sounded so different from what my mind said it should be. And even as I was speaking, my brain was like, what are you doing? You're just making up words now. You, you, you're waffling. You're embarrassing yourself. You should, you should, you should stop. Um, and Claude said, carry on carry on because I was I was there were gaps you know I, it's the first time I had ever spoken in tongues and I didn't even know I was speaking in tongues to me I was just saying things nothing what I said made sense and then he put his hand on my shoulder and he said let me interpret what you have said and I felt so relieved I was like oh, okay so that was it that was me speaking in tongues my goodness, I felt like such a fool. But that was my flesh telling me that. You see, the things of the spirit are foolish to the flesh. And it's written somewhere in the, in the New Testament, I believe. Um, and that you will be battling between your mind and your heart. So, yeah, after that, uh, he gave his interpretation. And I was like, Oof, cool. <laughs> And I just thought, like, now do I have to carry on? <laughs> um, and, and then he said, okay, cool, we're done with that. Um, and yeah, I felt a bit relieved because I do not like being on stage, being the main fixation. So it was very, was a very different experience for me. Um, and it, it was incredible that I actually did it, given who I am. Um, but it, I knew I was doing it why didn't I? So it was absolutely must. And I told myself, you know, it doesn't really matter what you want to do. It doesn't mean it really matter where you're comfortable because it's not about you. It's about God and you love him. So you're doing this. And that was it. Um, yeah. And after, after he gave the interpretation, they, he said, now that we're going to baptize you. And I felt free. I felt cleansed completely. I felt how do I explain it? Um, like when you get a new phone, it's free of anything. You can do whatever you want with it. It's yours. It's clean. You don't have to load anything onto it. It's just, it runs beautifully. It's just, it's just beautiful. When you get a new book, it's just so clean. There's the nothing screen. I can really say to describe it. And on the phone, the yes. screen is still screen unscratched. Is beautiful. It's new. It's awesome. I also love that first day of a new phone. Mm, yeah, and it's perfect. You see, and that is how I felt. I felt complete. That's. I think that's it. That's that's the best explanation I can give. So I just want to say to the listeners that that day we did counselling with Drew, and then we we prayed for deliverance. 
and then we prayed for him to be filled with the spirit and he was speaking in tongues which is a sign that you were filled with the spirit and then baptism so many events mm. in one and it was good it was good to do all those things um and i'm happy to hear that you said that you had a need for counseling you had a need to get these things off your chest and um, and so forth. So, and the days following that, how would you compare that to the days before? It's freeing. You know, as I said, you don't know that you're carrying a burden until it's been taken away. So you're no longer carrying it. Like if you're carrying, like if you're wearing heavy clothes, you don't know it's heavy until you've taken it off. And then you feel lighter. You feel as though you can jump straight to the moon. And that is how I felt. I've clean and free, complete freedom, you know. In certain days, I would feel darkness. And I would be fighting this darkness. And now I don't. I feel so there's a warm light in me. And that is the Ruach. And I feel so much better walking through life because now situations that I'm uncomfortable in I'm like Ruach, guide me show me what I'm <laughs> to do show me what I have to say and then it's like okay so this is what you shouldn't be doing I was like okay cool thank you because I was doing that and now you have to do this <laughs> I was like okay let me do that then it's having something in you that you can rely on that's guiding you and helping you so that when you start doubting things, it starts telling you, it's okay, just, just do it this way, you know? And it's been completely different. My experiences with my family, um, with my boss, with my friends, completely different. I feel like a brand new person. I feel before there would be this weight of, I need to hold myself back because... I'm going to lose it at any second, at any at, at any given second. I'm going to lose my mind. I'm just, just going to snap and go crazy. And this was a reality for me. So this wasn't like, I'm going to go crazy. They're going to put me in a mental asylum. It's, I'm going to go crazy. I'm probably going to kill a few people. You know, it was, it was, it was complete darkness that I was struggling against. My darkest self. And I do not feel that at all. I feel shalom. Praise Father. This is amazing. I love it. He is so yeah. good. And imagine the fact that God wants to put his spirit in you. So mm. you were led by the spirit. You were led by the spirit without being filled by the spirit. You were led yeah. to follow the scripture. You were even in that time when you were like speaking to demons, you were still wanting to be with God when that demon said, you need to choose choose either God or me, but we cannot like continue. You cannot have both. You chose God. Mm. And yet when the time came, when you were delivered, you were filled with the spirit and you were baptized. That was a critical time in your walk with Elohim. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. That was the pinnacle of where my old life and my new life crashed into each other. And I could properly let go of the past, let go of everything that I was struggling against and become this new creation and become clean. It's like a hard reset within yourself. And I feel ready. I love it. Praise Elohim. So tell me, Drew, last thing, if there was one thing that you wanted everyone in the world to know, what would that be? There is one thing. It's one thing that the, the Ruach has put on my heart two days ago. Is that if you had not come into existence, if you weren't meant to live, you sure would have suffered a little less. In all things. Know that despite everything, Yeshua saw you and Yeshua know, knew this. Yeshua looked at you. He looked at your sin and he, he understood that if he asked Adonai, do not let this person come to me, there would have been less pain that he would have had to go through. And he looked at you 
And he said, no, but you are worth it. You are why I'm doing this. And he bore that extra pain just so that you can be set free, just so that you can feel the love he has for you. So, and he died for you as much as he died for his disciples, as much as he died for the people that put him on the cross because he loves you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your testimony. May Father guide you. May he lead you. May he bless you mm. in all your ways. May he protect you. May he send his angels to protect you. Um, and may he teach you. And this is why the Ruach mm, was sent. You. This is why the Ruach is placed within us to teach us. He said, I will place my spirit within them to teach them and to show them the way that they should mm. go. So may may that continue. May you always listen to the Ruach. Um, yeah. So thank you for your time. Thank you to the listeners. Um, Please comment in please comment down below that you have watched up until the end and what your biggest takeaway is. Shalom. Definitely. Shalom.